So here we are, chapter 2, Acts. We'll look at verses 14 through 21 and begin our study. Luke writes, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I've been doing that a lot lately. <laughs> and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm going to give you a little information, some information I didn't give you last time we were together, uh, because there are a couple of things that I didn't even touch on that I want to touch on, and then we'll move on in to this uh, Pentecost sermon and all of that. But as I lay a foundation, I'll remind you that the, uh, the day of Pentecost has fully arrived, and the promise that God had made in the Old Testament, as well as reiterated through the mouth of Jesus, that promise has been fulfilled. In uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus had commanded his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem, and they had. He said there, uh, being, it says there, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so something that is very simple but important to remember, and if you write this down, it'll be a blessing in your life. Very basic thing, obedience results in blessing. Just remember that. Obedience to the Lord results in blessing. It was such a basic thing. It's interesting how Jesus' call for obedience is repeated over and over again in the New Testament. It's such a basic teaching, but it seems that the Lord from the Old Testament to the New Testament has to repeat this one thing over and over again. He says to obey is better than sacrifice. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it's, it's a central theme of a, of a person's walk with God, simple obedience. You see, when you, when you are obedient to the word of God, when you're obedient to God, he shows up in wonderful ways. In, in John 14, Jesus said it like this at verse 21, John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself, manifest myself to him. I will manifest, I will show myself to the one who obeys me because if he obeys me, he loves me. So it's a very basic thing. And yet in the body of Christ, it has to be repeated over and over again. Obey me. To obey is better than sacrifice. Obey me. You see that from the Old to the New Testament. And Jesus had said it. He had simply said to them, um, just don't depart from Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. John baptized with water. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It's a simple command. Just wait. Tarry in Jerusalem in an obedience. God is going to pour out a blessing on you. And so, as we've seen, they waited obediently. And they waited expectantly for the promise. And the promise was fulfilled. Now, one of the things I didn't really speak to you about, and I'm going to point it out very quickly, is found in chapter 1, verse 13, as well as verse 15. In verse 13, chapter 1, when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, 
the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Uh, these continued with one accord in, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And so I wanted to speak to you a little bit about that and share a little bit about this because what we have is we actually have 120 people who are awaiting the promise that the Lord uh, Jesus Christ had given. There's 120 that are waiting. Uh, it says in verse 15, uh, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples altogether. The number of the names was about 120. And so I didn't even mention to you who those 120 were. And so I'm going to give you their names one at a time. No, I'm not. I'm just teasing. <laughs> but I didn't mention that. There were 120. And the question would be asked, who were these 120 people? We know that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ intended to fulfill his promise to the apostles. But the apostles who had remained faithful at that time were numbering only 11. Then they added, as we know, the, uh, the new apostle to take the place of the one who fell, Matthias, took the place of Judas. But so who are these 120 and where do we get the number? Because it mentions that again in verse 15, there was about, and it's the word about, there were about 120. Who were they? Well, all we need to do is remember some basic things in Scripture. One, you need to remember that in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 and 17, it speaks concerning the fact that Jesus had spoken to his men and said that he would meet them on a mountain in Galilee. And the men went there, but the men were not alone there. There were others who had shown up alongside of him. It speaks concerning in verse 17 that it says this, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And so not amongst the 11, it wasn't amongst the 11 faithful that had this, this is too good to be true attitude, but there were other people who were there. Now, how do we know that? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, that verse mentions that there were over 500 eyewitnesses of Jesus after his resurrection. When you look at Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, those verses speak of women who followed Jesus and financially supported him. In Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 17, those verses mention 70 disciples that Jesus has sent to preach the kingdom of God is near. And so the number 120 would include the 11 apostles, the 70 disciples, the women who followed Jesus. They would include even as we read a moment ago, Mary, uh, Jesus' brothers, and many of the eyewitnesses that were spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. That's where the 120 that are mentioned here, and it's almost offhand in verse 15, that's where those numbers would have come from. So the 120 disciples in the upper room who are awaiting in obedience were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And as we saw last time we were together, the result was a supernatural gifting with tongues, languages that were unlearned. And as we saw, they began praising and magnifying God in languages that they had never learned. Now, it had stated in verse 5 of chapter 2. Here's something else I didn't share with you. In verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Notice the word devout. Devout men from every nation under heaven. I didn't point out something about that. The word devout, what does that mean? We don't use that word very much anymore. But the word devout literally speaks of being cautious and careful as to the realization of the presence and claims of God. It speaks of reverencing God. It speaks of fear and love combined, which produces reverence. The Old Testament placed emphasis on fear, but the New Testament emphasizes love. Though there was love in the fear of God's saints then, there must also be fear in their love of God now. And so these devout individuals were careful and cautious is what it's speaking about. And these were individuals who would not necessarily be taken in. So they were careful and cautious as it pertains to their walks with God and what God has said. But when this takes place, when these 120 were baptized by the Holy Spirit and spilled out and began to speak in these unlearned languages, 
we read that these people were confused as well as amazed, and they began to question amongst themselves, what is happening? So as some of these people are beginning to say, what is happening? Others, as we noted last time, began to mock, thinking that they'd been drinking wine and had gotten themselves drunk. Now, I have to say this, and this is all just laying a foundation for you. The disciples were not staggering around. They weren't laughing hysterically like some drunks. I've been around happy drunks, and I've been around angry ones. If you've got to be around a drunk, I guess a happy one's better than a mad one. But what this is, and, and there's really a reason I'm going to tell you this, because not that long ago, there was a movement, and it's still around. I mean, you still see it. It's not quite as much now as it was before, where people were beginning to say that when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit, perhaps some of you are aware of this, perhaps you saw this, or maybe, may even have experienced this yourself, they would say that you were drunk in the Spirit, and all kinds of outlandish things began to happen. There were people doing crazy things. I don't even want to go, it's not even decent to express to you what was taking place sometimes in church services, and people were blaming the Spirit of God for these things. You know, it was bad enough some were barking like dogs in church services, and some were meowing like cats, and I'm not making this up. And I often wondered, what if that dog was married to the cat? Does that mean that they fight like cats and dogs? And I, I, but it was just an odd, it was an odd time in the church where the most outlandish things were being blamed on God and the Holy Spirit. And they would point to this particular portion of Scripture when it says in chapter 2, verse 13, others mock and said they are full of new wine. And so what was being said, and it is still repeated, not as much now as it was just a few years ago, that you can become what is called drunk in the spirit. And perhaps some of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. And you would see them staggering around, staggering around in, in the church. I've seen it. I have seen it with my eyes, those kinds of things. And they're blaming God, saying, God made me do this because I'm drunk in the Holy Spirit, like in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 13. But I want you to notice there's a reason that I bring these things up to you. So you're equipped to answer these things should you ever encounter it. I want you to see others mocking said they're drunk. And so this was a slam. This was something they were saying against them as a way of simply mocking them. What you need to remember is that the fruit of the Spirit... According to Galatians 5.23, the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. Self-control is an evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And a lack of self-control can actually be one of the evidences that you are unsaved, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, where he speaks of the unsaved as being without self-control. So when the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, he is actually producing the fruit of self-control, not a lack of control. Keep that in mind, because if you watch any what is called Christian TV, you might still see these kinds of things being perpetrated in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, what you have here is people who are confused, and they're making an observation in order to dismiss what they're seeing. So Peter is going to bring a scriptural explanation for a spiritual manifestation. Now, we believe that God gives us direction through his word, and we examine the Bible to find God's explanation on anything that is spiritual. Like the Bereans, who when they heard what Paul had to say, examined the scriptures to see whether these things are so. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it simply says, Test all things and hold fast what is good. And so we need to have directions through the Bible, through the Word of God. And that's why you'll hear me every time I open the Word. In one form or another, I will say to you, spend time in God's Word personally. Not simply here, and I thank God that you bring your Bibles and you open them. Of course, of course. 
But make a habit of doing that when you're by yourself. Reading God's word and getting imbibed with the things of God. Because that helps you to not be conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so that's what happens when you yield yourself as a living sacrifice to God. And so what we have here is a very interesting thing. I want to point this out. Notice verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. This to me is so important that I could almost easily pass it up because um, uh, I just read it so very often. I don't really let myself meditate on what has taken place. But let me remind you, who is this speaking? The Apostle Peter. Peter, now wait a minute. You're the one who denied the Lord. And it wasn't that long ago. Sometimes we don't realize that these kinds of things that are taking place were in, within two months of one another. From his denial of the Lord to standing in front of everybody. From his hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities to him standing up in front of all of these people and preaching, something happened. Something happened. Listen, do you want to be used by God? I, I'm going to speak to some who do. Do you want to be used by God? Get filled with the Spirit. Because if you walk in the flesh, you're not pleasing to God, and you will not be used by the Lord. But Pentecost has fully arrived, guys. The Holy Spirit, in the shape of, of flaming tongues, landed on each individual. And the result is, the man who denied the Lord is now confessing him openly. Where does this boldness come from? From the Spirit of God. It comes from the Spirit of God. Do you want to be used by the Lord? I have had people say this to me in the past. You know, you're pretty, you're pretty bold. How did that happen? Be, be filled with the Spirit. You don't even realize that you're bold. You, you don't. You don't even realize it. People call you bold and you don't even know that. You don't even know if they're kidding. You're joking. Are you joking? Well, how come you, how come you speak so easily? What do you mean? How come you speak so easily? It seems so natural. It's not. Naturally, I'm shy. Naturally, I'm reserved. Naturally, I'm to myself. Naturally, my opinions are mine. I don't want to give them to anybody else. Why would I give my opinions to people so they can tear them up? And No, I don't do that. Keep it to myself. But you're not that way with the Lord. You want to be used by the Lord? Ask God, fill you with the Spirit. Fill me with the Spirit, Lord. I want to be used. This man who denied Jesus, this is so important. You see, if there's anything the church needs today, it's spirit-filled believers to start opening their mouths. We need that desperately. No, I'm not saying be rude, and I'm not saying be argumentative. No, I'm not saying we should go out and with a bullhorn yell at people in cars passing by. I'm not saying that. If the Lord leads you to do that, say you go to another church. <laughs> where's your confidence come from it comes from God Peter denied the Lord less than two months before three times and now he's standing in front of everybody and preaching in front of as you'll see a great number of people where'd that come from it came from the power of the Holy Spirit and if there's anything that pastors need today, it's much more than their natural abilities and capacities. I thank God for the humorous pastors. I have many friends who are very funny. You know, my friend Rawl, I've had to pull over. Years ago, I was listening to him. I would have to pull over. I'd be laughing so hard at the things he said. I remember once, I'll give you one instance. Uh, he was saying this, it's really important. He said, write this in the margarine of your Bible. And I thought, <laughs> he just used to make me laugh. He still does. He still, he still does. When I lost my memory a few years ago, I lost my memory. He called me at my house. He said, David. He calls me David, not David. David. <laughs> David. He says, 
you lost your memory. And I said, yes, I did. He goes, do you remember you owe me $200? That was, that's wrong. he's terrible. He's terrible. So, so, so where does your confidence come from? Where, do, where does your ability to communicate without fear come from? It comes from the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Open, God says, open your mouth and I will fill it. It is the spirit of your father who speaks. Take no thought as to how you're going to answer these when you stand before councils, for it is the spirit of your father who will give you the words. What you do is you prepare your heart and say, here am I, Lord, use me. And that's what Peter basically is doing. The Holy Spirit has fallen on the 120. They're baptized with the Holy Spirit. They pour it out of that upper room. They're speaking concerning the mighty works of God. Some people are confused and amazed. Others begin to mock. The Apostle Peter seizes on that opportunity to explain a spiritual thing with Scripture, and he preaches with a boldness to people who just a couple of months ago he would have been afraid would have taken him and put him, put him to death. And so he stands, according to verse 15, to give an explanation. He stands, it says, with the eleven. This would speak, of course, of the apostles. And he immediately dismisses the mocking and he enters into his sermon. He says in verse 16, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so the prophet Joel wrote some 835 years before Christ. When he says this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, I need to say that this prophecy that is being spoken of here has not been totally fulfilled and will not be totally fulfilled until the 1,000-year reign and final judgment. And at, at that time, it will all be completely fi, uh, fulfilled because at that time, all will be filled with the Spirit. What this is, he's saying, is a foretaste of what is yet to occur. And so he begins to speak. And he says in verses 17 and 18, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They shall prophesy. And so, this is the present era when he speaks concerning the last days. Joel wrote, it shall come to pass in the last days. This is the present era where God is saving men. The last days include when Jesus first came up until his return. But in this context, his spirit is being poured out on all flesh. That word poured, it means to be uh, gushing out. It speaks of an abundance. In, in Acts 10, verse 45, you'll see the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. It's a gushing forth, an abundance, if you will. And God had said in Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. So this is a prophecy that was fulfilled where the pouring out of the spirit happens. And as this is happening, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. He goes on to say this, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. God is going to be moving. He's going to be moving through men and women. It's a picture of God directing them. So sons and daughters will prophesy. Sometimes we don't even realize that the Lord is moving in a prophetic way where we're speaking concerning an event that, that will happen. Let me give you uh, an example. Many years ago, probably 36 years ago at least, maybe 37 years ago, I was an assisting pastor in another fellowship. A friend of mine named Larry and his wife, Donna, Marie, my wife and I had known them from prior to me um, going into a full-time ministry. I'd known them for a long time. And Donna and Larry went to Calvary Chapel Downey. 
Donna was infertile, but she had made arrangements to adopt a child. And so she had the baby, but they had yet to formalize the adoption. And so she calls me and she says, David, she said, I have a child. I'm adopting the child. It's a small baby, an infant. And she said to me, can you dedicate my, my little girl? And I said, I'd be honored. And so we made arrangements for her to come on a Sunday morning. And when she came to church with her baby, I had never done this before and I've never done it since. When she handed me the baby, this, adopt, this baby to be adopted, she handed me the baby as, actually, I'll give you a second, thing, but anyway, uh, it happened in a different way some other time. But anyway, I was holding the baby, and as I was holding the baby, I looked at Donna, the adoptive mother, and as I was sharing, I looked at her and I said, a sword is going to pierce your soul. Where'd that come from? We're dedicating a baby. You don't say stuff like that. And I shook my head, and she's looking at me puzzled. And I said, and a sword shall pierce your soul. And I prayed for the baby. Within, I don't remember how long, within a few months, they took the baby from her. They took the baby from her. That was a prophetic word. I said, you don't know, hold on, hold on. A sword is going to pierce your soul, Donna. I've never done anything like that. When my son Joseph was born, and I was in the hospital room, Marie gave birth, and they brought the baby to me and handed me Joseph. I still remember looking at this baby saying, and I lifted the baby in my hands like this before the Lord. And I said, and this one, shall serve the Lord. My son Joseph has an anointing, and I've watched him. 35 years, I'm watching God's work in this young man. He's a reader, a communicator, loves Jesus, and I know God uses that young man. He was the one kid, the other three, eh, but this one here. <laughs> Just kidding, quite obviously. But there is this time of speaking forth God. And this, is, this isn't something made up. This is what the scripture says. The scripture makes it very clear. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men, he said, shall see visions. Visions are also called waking dreams. No, I don't pretend to have experienced all the things that are being said here. But I can give you one instance of this, too. I was laying in bed, and it was it's like 5 in the morning. And the, the room became, you won't believe this, but I'll say it anyway, it's true. The room became bright, but only in a certain area. And I remember opening my eyes. And in front of me were two young people. And I looked at them and I said, this is, anyway, I don't know why I don't like to tell you these things, because it sounds crazy. Um, <laughs> but it's true. And I, I looked at them and I said, who are you? They're in my room. What are you doing here? I didn't have ADT at the time. How'd you get in here? And it was glowing. And they said, we are angels sent from God to anoint you for the pain that you're about to go through. And I looked at them. I said, if you're sent from God, is Jesus Christ, God, the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity? Is he God in the flesh? And they laughed and said, of course he is. And one reaches over, I'll never forget this, and touches my forehead. And a warmth went through my body, and they disappeared. And I, I turned, and I woke up, and I shook Marie. You remember this. I shook Marie. I said, we had angels in the room. She goes, okay, honey. 
<laughs> you did. Okay, honey, go back to sleep. And I did. And is this true or is this not true? We went through some of the deepest pain we've ever gone through shortly after that. Remember? And we made it through because the Lord was with us. I, I believe these things. I don't believe it happens to everybody. I don't know why these things have happened to me. I really don't. I don't talk about them because I don't elevate them above Scripture and the Spirit of God. But these things are true. These things are true. Your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men, they dream dreams. Well, look in your scripture and you'll see that God used dreams. It was in the Old Testament, one of the ways that the Lord would speak. You see it, I'll give you names. Some you'll recognize, others you may not. But God had, had spoken through dreams to a man named Abimelech, to Jacob, to Laban, to Joseph, Jacob's son. He used a dream to speak to Pharaoh, to Solomon. In the New Testament, he spoke to Joseph. And he did use the medium of dreams in the Old Testament. In the book of Job 33, verses 14 through 16, Job 33, 14 through 16, it says, God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it in a dream. In a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. In Numbers 12, verse 6, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. And so this is not something unusual that you find. It was actually something spoken of in the Old Testament. Now, dreams could be used by the Lord and were used by God to communicate, but they can also be a means of deception. And that's why anything that you think the Lord is seeking to you in a dream needs to be tested by Scripture. In, in Jeremiah 23, 32, God warned the nation by saying, I am against those who prophesy false dreams declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. I didn't send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. And so you always test whatever by scripture. But he goes on in verse 18, on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God's spirit is going to move, he says, on all flesh. He's speaking forth God's word. It's going to occur during that time. In verse 19, he says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. All of these signs obviously are intended to point to the power of God. Blood and fire, vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness. These events are the events that are spoken of that surround the second coming and the signaling of the establishment of the kingdom of Jesus. And it gives us insight into how long God will pour out his spirit. He's going to do it until the return of Christ. So those who enter into millennial reign with Jesus will be a fulfillment of this word. So this is his proof text. Then he moves in, begins to preach. Verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope because you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And so now he addresses the people who are listening. And with authority, I want you to see what he does. He calls them to listen and to listen to him very carefully. He speaks concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Mark this in your heart. 
Jesus of Nazareth is the center of all true preaching. Jesus of Nazareth is the center of all true preaching. When Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he said, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom. As I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ, this is so basic, but the church is forgetting it. This is so basic. We've turned things around. I don't want to belabor this. I might share a little bit on Saturday about this. We have turned things around, guys, in our day in a way that I really believe God is dishonored. I really do. I was watching a well-known television preacher the other day, Marie and I, for just a moment. I, I don't watch them very long because I become critical and then I bring it to you and then... But let me use this as an illustration. He was teaching out of a book that I'm familiar with. He gave an opening and I sat to listen to see what he was going to do with those verses. And it was an opening that related to God, to his glory, to his causing people to look to him for their future. That's what the passage speaks about. But his message hinged on, on, on the people he was speaking to. And what you end up with is a message that is about man and not about Jesus and not about God. But people flock to hear this guy speak because he makes them feel good when they do. The problem is, is he's not teaching the passage. He's using it as a launching pad to cater to the whims, fancies, and carnal desires of his audience. That concerns me. It concerns me deeply. Because on the one hand, yes, God wants to heal our broken hearts. Jesus came to do that. And yes, God has our tears in his bottle. He doesn't forget them. And I thank God for the comfort of God. But Christianity doesn't hinge on me, it hinges on him. And when I know him, I'll be okay. But when I spend time trying to make me well, I will work the rest of my life and never be well. When I look at him, he heals my soul. He's the one who brings me to the place that he wants me to be. He's the one who's my comforter. That's very important and we're forgetting that. Thank you very much, that's, a, that's, that's true. That's, that's true. That's absolutely true. Briefly, and I'll move on because we've got a lot of verses to cover. One of the things that I love about when I got saved, and by the way, I, yesterday was my 46th anniversary, so I was thinking about this just yesterday of coming to faith in Christ. One, one of the things that, that was true that I've never stopped believing, and some people, by the way, believe this is old-fashioned and out of date and I have to speed up to where we are now. And I, I don't think that's going to happen. It can't. When we would go to worship, I was taught this from the day I got saved. Yes, there was joy and yes, you know, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That's something that happens in Jewish worship. If you go to the Western Wall and they're having a bar mitzvah or a wedding, whatever, there's a lot of clapping and shouting. You know, that's part of the Jewish culture and that was an expression of the joy that they have. Yes, I'm 100% behind that. But we were also taught that it's not about whether you like the band or like the song, because it wasn't about you, it was about him. And what I was taught to do from the beginning was just to do this. That was one way. The, the worship teams would tell us, don't be clapping for us, it's about him. So you see, that's in my blood. That's who I am. I'm a person who believes in giving him all the glory. And it doesn't go to man. It goes to him. See, a man didn't die 
A man, just an ordinary man, didn't die for me. The man, son of God, he died for me. That's why I give him glory. That's why I worship him. That's why the band, you know, can be a, a, a worshipful, yeah, or it can be a distraction. It just depends on who's being glorified. That's how it works. It, it's not, boy, it's not the quality of musicianship it's the power of the Holy Spirit upon a surrendered life. I was listening to a worship team once, and my worship leader went with me, and he spoke to me afterwards, and he said, did you think that God was present in worship today? And I said, absolutely. He said, let me, he said, I listened to that music uh, on tape, and the lead vocalist's voice was isolated and not a single note was hit. Every note that that worship leader sang was off tune. He said, and as a worship leader, that's reminding me, it's not about the quality of my voice, but the quality of my heart that God honors. And that's where worship really happens. Don't forget that. It's the quality of the heart. Has God done something for you? Has he? If he has, you can worship him. But what if the person doesn't sing well and they distract me? You know what? Then you're looking at them and not him, right? Let's keep our eyes on him because that's how it works. And, and in, the, in the teaching of the word of God, it's all about Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus was a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did. By supernatural means, he's saying, and works, God validated Jesus as Messiah. In verse 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, notice this, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. That is a powerful statement. Jesus' death was not by accident, it was God's determination. Jesus' death was determined by God for redemption. But it gives a call to accountability. Notice what he says. You have taken by lawless hands, you've crucified him, you put him to death. Now, these are unbelievers. They instigated the death of Messiah. And he is saying directly, this is so, so powerful, so bold. He's saying, you are guilty before God. He's saying, you need, you need Jesus Christ. Verse 24, God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death. It wasn't possible for death to hold him. He says in verses 25 through 28, David says, and he's speaking concerning the Lord, speaking prophetically through David in Psalm 16. And so he uses this psalm as a proof text for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we're living in a time, and I'll say this briefly, but it's true, where, where a lot of times ministers of the word are afraid of offending sensitive hearers. How many times can a person try and teach the word only to watch people get up and walk out? And it can be so distracting and it can be so discouraging. They won't even give a moment of their time to hear something they disagree with. They like the gospel as long as it agrees with their own opinions. But when something happens or is said they don't agree with, they just get up and walk out and never go back. Why? Was it untrue? Well, I don't like the way they said it. Really? Are you going to do what was said? Well, no, why would I? Because I don't like the way. We, it, it didn't form, it didn't align with my opinions, and therefore, I'm not going to give them a moment. I used to teach at this one church quite often. I was invited quite often. The pastor left that church. They never asked me back. But years ago, I still remember coming out and is doing their midweek, and I said something like this. I said, listen, every time I teach, someone gets up and they get mad and they walk out. Would you do me a favor today? Could you sit through the entire message and give me an opportunity to minister to you? Could you do that? Now, that's kind of open, don't you think? That's kind of honest. Halfway in, there's a guy off to my right, stands up, storms out, it was a metal door. I still remember him slamming the metal door as he walked out. 
And I thought, it was the pastor. He shouldn't have been such a bad example to the church. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what we have today. That's what we have today in the church. People who just, forgive me, none of you are doing this. I'll just be open with you. Rude. Just rude. When I was growing up, my mom taught me something. She said this, when your father speaks, you listen. That's what my mom would say. When your father speaks, you listen. And do you know, even until my father went home to be with the Lord, and I was already in my 50s when he died, we would be together for family things. And my dad was a very quiet man, very quiet. And he would sit there. He kind of just glowed with the family around. He just loved his family being around. And we'd be talking, and we're adults, we're older. My dad was quiet. My mom would be talking, people would be, my dad would say, you know, and instantly the room got quiet. Instantly. All four kids at the same time shut up. And I was my dad's pastor. And when my dad spoke, I listened. I learned a long time ago, when your father's speaking, you listen. The church needs to learn that too. When the Spirit of God is moving in a Bible study, listen, because God has something to say to your heart. You may not understand much, but what you do understand will bless your life. Amen. That is so important. And so he's speaking here, and he's speaking concerning David, and he's using the proof text uh, of this psalm as a proof text for the resurrection. And he says in verses 29 through 36, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up from the fruit, he would raise up, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so this psalm was not fulfilled by David because David died and did not experience that resurrection at that time. He's saying this is a prophecy related to Messiah. This is what is called a messianic psalm, and this was speaking concerning Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 36, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse, this twisted, this crooked generation. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 at one invitation. Again, Peter brought the point home with very strong and very direct words. He said in verse 36, you crucified Jesus, who was Lord in Christ. That, listen, if, you, if a person's going to get saved, they need to take personal accountability for the death of Christ. Jesus, God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is the potential savior of all men, the actual savior of those who believe. And so I had to see myself as the reason, if you will, that Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't mental error. It wasn't a bad upbringing. 
it wasn't my economic status. It wasn't my ethnic heritage. It wasn't any of that. It was a sin question. The question of sin needed to be answered. I had to see myself as a sinner lost and on my way to eternal judgment. Again, one last thought, and we'll close. My daughter brought my three grandchildren into my office yesterday, my daughter Corinne, three of my grandchildren. My Josiah, who's 13, my Sophie, who's eight, and my Stella, who's four. And they came walking in, and they said, Happy spiritual birthday, Papa. That was sweet. Happy spiritual birthday, Papa. And they all came and gave me hugs and kisses, and I smiled at them. And I started sharing with them. And I started saying, you know, and I, I started giving my testimony. I said, you know, your papa was not a good person. I said, I was arrested three times, all because it related to alcohol. I was a drunk. I got arrested, put in jail overnight, three different times. I said, you know, your papa was a very, very lonely young boy. And I started to cry. And Josiah's looking at me, and his little eyes begin to well with tears. And my Sophie, they're looking, they've never, I don't cry around the family. I cry in church. That's where I cry. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. They've never seen that in me. Never. Other than when they've been in church and they've seen, oh, Papa's touched by something, right? There I am sitting in my office, and I said, I was lonely and I was hurting. And I started to cry. And I said, but Jesus Christ saved me and transformed me. And look at what he's done. And I pointed to my kids and I said, he gave me grandma. He gave me your mama. And he gave me you. And how grateful I am for all that God has done. And that came because one day, 46 years ago, I said, I am the reason Jesus died on a cross. It was not that person or my dad's fault or my mom. It was me. He died for me, for my sins. I was separated, and he drew me back with cords of love. And that's a God I will worship forever, forever, because he is good. The only way to be saved is to personalize that. And Peter's boldness to point to them, you crucified him, is a powerful statement. Coming from a man who less than two months earlier had denied even knowing him. What's the difference? The difference was the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing that God gives and the proclamation of the Word of God. And if you have the power of the Spirit, the Word of God, He can give you boldness and God can use you to see others saved. Is there anything greater than that? No. Nothing is greater than seeing a life that was at one time going to hell turned around and now proceeding to heaven. What is greater than that? What is greater than that? Nothing.